It doesn't particularly worry me that prosperity preachers say that God wants you to prosper. You can find that in scripture. Abraham was rich. There's nothing wrong with money. The Bible speaks of the love of money. That's the root of all evil. It's what they don't say. I've been following them for about 40 years and I've never heard a well-known prosperity preacher preach Christ crucified for the sin of the world. They don't talk about sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. They are infatuated with self and wealth. They have no concern for the lost. They are not warning every man they may present every man perfect in Christ. It's the ultimate betrayal. That's what I hate about prosperity preaching. And we're going to look at that further on in this teaching. So are you a Christian? Yes. Do you ever share your faith with unbelievers? I would not know whether or not an unbeliever was actually an unbeliever unless I asked them. If someone dies in their sins, where do they go? You tell me. They go to hell. The Bible says that. Okay. Oh my goodness. That's a, such a scary thing uh, to consider. Can you think of a, a crime where you go to prison for doing nothing? Oh, I have no idea then. Well, if you've got a rope at your feet and there's a man drowning in front of him, you could save him, but you just stand there and do nothing and let him drown, you go to jail. Do you know what the name of that crime is? No. It's called depraved indifference. Ooh. If you see someone getting into a car, they're going downhill, there's no brakes in the car, and you know it, you become culpable. You're guilty of their blood because you haven't bothered to warn them. If you and I as Christians don't warn the ungodly about the reality of hell, we're guilty of their blood. The Bible says that, the book of Ezekiel. So you and I have a moral responsibility to share the gospel with the lost and say, if you die in your sins, Jesus said you're going to hell. That horrifies me. I'm coming, I'm coming to work with you. Well, you don't need me. You can, you can learn how to share your faith yourself, but don't let people go to hell, Alicia. Yes, Use your life as a light to warn people and say there's a very real hell. You need to repent and trust the Savior. I'm, I'm in the process of uh, reading my Bible again. I'm actually reading a book. They're talking about what you do with your talents and who, how, who's going to get their, their uh, money multiplied, so to speak, for doing the right thing. And uh, you're reaping what you sow. There are all kind of parables that are in there that... Um, that they're are... all concerning ourselves and our greed. Yes. Be careful of that stuff. Yes, of course. Think of unsaved people that go into hell and use your life to warn them. I was on a plane once and I saw a woman walking towards me wearing a t-shirt with a gospel on it. I thought, obviously a Christian, she had earphones on, she was listening to music, she sat next to me, and I greeted her, we chatted for a moment, and then she went back listening to her gospel music. I wondered if she was going to witness to me, I waited for an hour, and then I turned to her, tapped her, she took the earphones off, and I said, how do you get to heaven? She looked at me kind of weirdly and said, well, you don't want to go to hell, and put the earphones back on, and went back to her gospel music. She couldn't care less about the lost. And that's the essence of the prosperity preaching. Prosperity preachers reproduce after their own kind. False converts who have a heart of stone. Charles Spurgeon said, have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. Let me tell you why I believe so many are caught up in the prosperity movement. Remember the story of the prodigal son? He found himself in a famine feeding pigs and desiring filthy pig food. That's what brought him to his senses. That's what caused him to say, I'm going back to my father and saying, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. Make me a hired servant. Because the moral law has been forsaken by the contemporary church to show the sinner that sin is exceedingly sinful, he doesn't realize his desires are filthy, that we're all as an unclean thing and all our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. So he goes back to the Father and instead of saying, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, make me a hired servant, he goes back to the Father and says, Dad, I've run out of money, give me more, you become my servant. To them, Christianity becomes a means of gaining wealth. They suppose that gain is godliness. The tragedy is that most in this category couldn't care less that the world is going to hell. They're guilty of the crime of depraved indifference. Well-known atheist Penn Gillette said these powerful words about professed Christians who don't bother to warn the lost about the reality of hell. 
And I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell, and people could be going to hell and not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think it's not worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, and then he said this amazing statement. How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? If I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. Do you give any credibility to the Bible at all? Have you ever read it? I have read portions of it. If you're not a Christian, if you're not trusting in Christ, you're two-thirds of a person. You're made of a body, soul, and spirit according to the Bible. Your body's the machine. You've got cameras that you look out of. You've got an amplifier that you speak out of. And you've got a computer that makes everything work. That's your body. Then your soul is your self-conscious part, the area of your emotions and your will. But your spirit is your God-conscious part. And because your spirit's dead in sin, the Bible says, you're not conscious of God. Do you think the Bible is credible when it tells you you can find everlasting life? It's weird how he says that you can only have everlasting life by like doing like good deeds or like you have to be good. Well, the Bible says the opposite. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah, this is what it says. It's not by works of righteousness that he saves us, but according to his mercy. I'm going to tell you why the Bible says we die. Death is wages. Did you know that? No. Yeah. It says the wages of sin is death. In other words, God is paying you in death for your sins. Do you think you're a good person? Yes. Okay. We're going to try and get rid of that. Go to the 10th commandment. Have you ever desired something and belonged to somebody else? Something the Bible calls covetousness? Yes. Okay, you've broken the 10th. If you kept the first, it says you shall have no other gods before me. And that actually means you should put God first in your life. And you should love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because he gave you life. Before everyone else? Yeah. Do you love God above everything else? No, I wouldn't say that. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. Have you lied and stolen? Yes. So here's the summation. You're not a good person, you're just like the rest of us. You've told me that you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, and Jesus said if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Have you ever done that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Had sex out of marriage? Yeah. You've earned your wages. You've told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer at heart. So if God judges you by those commandments, we looked at five, on Judgment Day, will you be innocent or guilty? Oh, guilty. Heaven or hell? Mm. Well, with forgiveness, no. I would be going to heaven, isn't it? Yeah, that? but how can you get forgiveness? Isn't it just praying away? No. You know, but you don't value it. Have you heard of Jesus dying on the cross? Yes. What does that mean to you? How because of he died, he got like a huge community now of all these people worshiping him. The gospel is what we're looking at. The gospel means good news. And the good news is this, that Jesus abolished death. That's what the Bible says. You and I violated God's law. We broke the law. Jesus came and paid the fine. God commanded his love toward us and that while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. He suffered in our place, paid the fine, rose from the dead, defeated death. It was not possible that death could hold him, the Bible says. And if you'll just simply repent of your sins, that is, let them go. Do you know what repentance is? Mm, not exactly. It's more than confession. A lot of people think it's just confession. It's when you're contrite or really sorry for your sins and you turn from them. You can't say I'm a Christian, but you fornicate and lie and steal and blaspheme. That's just playing the hypocrites. You have to be sincere in your repentance. And if you'll simply repent and trust in Christ, the Bible promises God will grant you everlasting life as a free gift. The scriptures say, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that gift of the Holy Spirit is everlasting life. The second you put your faith in Jesus, you've got God's promise, he'll forgive your sins, every, all those secret sins, those sexual imaginations, the thing done in, things done in darkness, they're all washed away and forgotten in an instant. In fact, let me share something with you that's quite wonderful. The Bible says, he removes your sins as far as the east is from the west. It's an infinite distance. I'll tell you why. You can find north and you can find south. You can go to the North Pole and you can measure the distance from north to south. But you can't find east or west. It's an infinite distance. And the Bible is very specific. When you come to Christ and repent, he removes your sins as far as the east is from the west. Totally annihilated. All those sins he washes away in an instant. 
all because of what Jesus did on the cross. And then he legally grants you everlasting life. Like the judge will let you go because someone paid you fine. That's legal. God will legally grant you everlasting life as a he free paid, gift. He paid our fine dying on the cross? Yeah, he paid the fine when he died on the cross. Took our place. That's the good news of the gospel. And there's no better news you could ever hope to hear. You know, there should be millions lining up to hear the gospel, but people are too engrossed in the pleasures of sin because there's great pleasure in pornography and fornication and adultery. Great pleasure, we're like moths to a flame. But when you, come, when you come to Christ, God will change your heart so you love righteousness and you love doing that which is right and you've got the knowledge that death has no hold on you all because of God's grace. Is this making sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, I have learned well, well, what you're speaking about. Yeah, I kind of understand a lot more from what I knew earlier when you first approached me. Are you going to think about what we talked about? Oh yeah, of course. I'm already thinking about it right now, yeah. Man, you've been so gracious to listen to me. Are you going to think about what we talked about? I will. The devil is real. And you know what Satan does? He blinds the minds of those that believe not. That's what the Bible tells us. He doesn't want you to get saved. He's, yeah. he's the enemy of your soul. And yet God has no pleasure in your death. And the only way you'll repent is if you acknowledge your sins, see your danger, and put your trust in Christ. Can you think of a... A crime where you go to prison for doing nothing? Oh, I have no idea then. Well, if you've got a rope at your feet and there's a man drowning in front of you and you could save him, but you just stand there and do nothing oh, and let him drown, you go to jail. Do you know what the name of that crime is? No. It's called depraved indifference. Yeah. Depraved means as low as you can get. Yeah. Indifference means you couldn't care less. And the reason I've pleaded with you today is because I don't want to be guilty of the crime of depraved indifference. Your life is in terrible danger. You're not aware of it, and I'm throwing a rope to you and say, Maddox, please grab that rope. Put your faith in Christ, and he'll do the rest. He'll pull you to safety, he'll pull you out of death, and he'll save you and change you, and you'll be born again, new heart, new desires. So his word becomes alive, and not only that, you'll love righteousness. That's the miracle of conversion. When a sin-loving sinner begins to love righteousness, that's a miracle, and it's your own personal miracle, and it'll show you that God is true to his word, and you'll pass from death to life. So you're going to think about what we talked about? I will. You have a Bible at home? I do. Would you be embarrassed if I pray with you? No. Father, I pray for Maddox. Thank you for this divine encounter today. I pray that he will think seriously about his secret sins and he will tremble at the thought of sinning against you. Find a place in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can I give you a book I've written? Yeah. I really, I really like what you're doing. Say that again? I really like what you're doing. Is mine? Yeah. I'll read it. Okay, you'll, you'll read it? I will. Okay, that's wonderful. Great to talk to you, man. Great talking to you. When are you going to repent and put your faith in Christ? I mean, knowing me, I'd still willingly just commit more of the, what are they called? Sins. More, more, more of the sins. God will give you a personal miracle. What he'll do is create a clean heart in you that loves righteousness. Remember before I said you're only two-thirds a person until you come to Christ? Mm -hmm. When your spirit is made alive, when you're born again, then you become conscious of God, and God will give you a thirst for what's called righteousness, or doing the right thing. And you'll realize because God gave you life, he should be first in your affections. The eyes you see through are a gift from God. The brain you're thinking with is a gift from God. Your breathing is a gift from God, life itself. So you owe him everything. All the loved ones, your dog, you know, the freedom of this country, the blueness of the sky, the sound of birds, the sun rising, all of, all of it is his goodness to us. And so that'll change everything, and you'll just long to do that which is right. Now, you'll still have a sinful nature. You'll still be tempted to look at porn and do things that are wrong. But the Holy Spirit will help you overcome those weaknesses. The Bible promises that. It says this, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful and will, with the temptation, make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's a Bible verse. So you're going to get temptations, but God's going to make a place where you can escape. You know, some woman says, hey, come and get in the sack with me. Well, there's a door that says exit on it. You can run out. Well, that's what Joseph did in the Bible. He was tempted to commit adultery, and he ran. And the Bible says flee fornication. And it's because with the pleasures of sin comes death and hell. And that should put the fear of God in you. So you've, you've made my day, Jordan, being so open and honest. Um, I want you to really think about this with the thought that you could die tonight in your sleep. God forbid, but how old are you? 18. Yeah, tonight. You just wake up dead, and everyone says, Wow, I thought he was healthy. He looked healthy. He had a bad heart. Happens all the time. 150,000 people die every 24 hours. 
So the Bible says God commands all men everywhere to repent. It says today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart because you're going to be tempted by sin. Just get somewhere quiet and say, God, please forgive me. Wash me. I put my faith in Christ. And when you do that, you'll be made a new creature and you'll wake up in the morning with a brand new heart, new desires. Happened to me over 50 years ago and I'm still shocked at the radical nature of conversion. Would you be embarrassed if I pray for you? No. Father, I pray for Jordan that this day he will consider his secret sins and realize that he shared them with you, a holy God, and your wrath abides on him. May he fear you and may he depart from sin with your help and be converted, be born again with a new heart and new desires. Please help him to understand your love expressed in the cross, your holiness that was also expressed through that cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can I give you a Gospel of John? Yeah, of course. Do you know what a Gospel of John is? Uh, I know of a Gospel. <laughs> the reason it's bundled like money is it's more precious than all the money in the world because it tells you how to find everlasting life. What did you say? I said, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> You're going to read it? Of course. That really is a shock, though. I was here trying to open it. <laughs> hey, good to talk to you, Jordan. Yeah, of course. Good to talk to you, too. Thank you. Yeah. Make sure you check out the Living Waters podcast. And this is the Evidence Study Bible. It's everything I've learned in more than 50 years of reaching out to the lost. It's packed with information on apologetics, cults, evolution, atheism, and much more. Over 1,900 pages, including 200 of the most commonly asked questions of the Christian faith. And make sure you check out the Starter Kit. It contains four of our most popular tracks, including 50 Ten Commandment Coins. Available at livingwaters.com. Have you seen our video, Why Did Dinosaurs Disappear? It'll boost your faith in God's Word. You can watch it right now by clicking up to your left.